Okay, so I'd like to invite our next speaker, uh, Jane Martin. Hello. My name is uh, Jane Martin. I'm an advanced nurse specialist from the Macmillan Unit Hospice down in um, sunny Dorset. And um, we're a 16-bedded hospice, and we cover around 250 to 300 community patients at any one time. Our service is jointly funded by Macmillan Caring Locally, which is a local charity, and the Royal Bournemouth and Christchurch Dorset um, NHS Trust. Um, we cover both um, urban and quite rural as well, so we have a, have a real mix of uh, patients. My experience is in, in specialist palliative care, but as um, I've um, been in a specialty um, for several years, I've developed more of an interest in the neurological um, life-limiting diagnosis of our patients and now um, cover all the patients that are diagnosed in our area with MND and that can be anything from about 15 to 25 patients at any one time. Ali, um, one of our senior physiotherapists who's sitting down here in the row if there are any questions later, um, both herself and me have developed some training um, for our team that we'd like to share with you today. This is Dorset, as you can see it's very lovely and it's very sunny if you'd like a nice holiday. Um, and this is where we're based, the Specialist Palliative Care Service. We look after all people living with MND in East Dorset, um, from diagnosis right through to the end of life, both in the community and in the hospice. As most of you know already, non-invasive ventilation is a symptomatic and life-prolonging treatment that is now widely used in the care of people with MND. These people experience progressive muscle weakness and wasting, and this can include the muscles of respiration. NIV assists patients breathing as their disease progresses in a similar way to an electric bike when you tire from cycling. Patients can become dependent on NIV as they approach the end of their life. Book published the first large multi-center randomized control trial in 2006. And this was a key milestone in MND research. It showed for patients without swallowing and speech symptoms, NIV increased survival by up to about 18 months. There was also significant improvement in symptoms due to hypercapnia, such as morning headaches and wakeful nights, for those with or without bulbar symptoms. In 2010, NICE published guidance for NIV in people with MND. With wide implementation of these guidelines, the use of NIV has markedly increased. The Respiratory Centre at Southampton Hospital, which is our nearest specialist NIV service, was rapidly expanding its home ventilation programme at that time. From 2010 onwards, we saw the impact of this on our service, as people living with MND were increasingly choosing NIV, and dependent on this approaching the end of their lives. Some patients, however, did decide to stop using the NIV in our hospice, and this actually was one of the trigger points um, for this project. So utilizing the need for training for the service improvement, we utilized firstly staff feedback Staff feedback and reflections following NIV withdrawal showed that some had found this distressing and there was a lack of clarity regarding the law and ethics around the context of withdrawal of NIV. As we know, sometimes it's more difficult to contemplate withdrawing treatment than to actually start a treatment. Staff said things to us like, is this assisted suicide? and I felt like I'd killed her when I took that mask off. 
In addition, there was a lack of competence in practical management of the equipment. I often um, quote a saying to my colleagues, and I'm sure some of you have probably heard of it, the post hoc ergo propter hoc Latin. For since event Y followed event X, event Y must have been caused by event X. And this is very pertinent when we think about why people, why our staff are distressed on the withdrawal of NIV. Because they feel that the, with the death of that patient was followed very quickly following the withdrawal of the mask. And therefore, the death must have been caused by them withdrawing the mask when actually they have died from their disease of MND. So we looked at the evidence. Looking at some of the evidence, Baxter published qualitative research into the effects of NIV withdrawal on families and healthcare professionals, suggesting that the terminal phase of MND could be unexpectedly rapid. Early advanced care planning was advocated, acknowledging, however, that this can be really difficult. Deciding about NIV is just one of the many difficult and complex advanced care planning decisions the person living with MND has to make through this journey. And indeed, Fall in 2014 emphasises that early decision making due to the risk of the onset of cognitive changes can further limit future discussions. Additionally, Harris in 2015 suggested that allied health professionals need to listen to a person's existential concerns for life and death early in their illness trajectory and while they can still communicate. And recent evidence actually supports this. Levi in 2017 suggests that when people living with MND fail to communicate their future wishes and their wishes for medical treatment, the consequence is often suboptimal decision making during a crisis. So, identifying the training needs for the service and our quality improvement. An audit of our hospice found that between June 2014 and September 2015, there were 303 days with a person with MND in our hospice, and of those, 59 days where a person was using NIV. This helped quantify the need for ward-based training. Hospice staff lacked confidence in when to start these discussions, both around the appropriateness of commencing NIV or not, and the future possibility of withdrawal of that NIV. There was a perceived complexity regarding the decision making, and some felt that this was a medical responsibility only. This was despite an advanced level of communication skills around advanced care planning and end of life care that's inherent within a hospice NMDT. Simmons in 2007 found that some hospices are not familiar with the use of NIV. And indeed, at that time, our hospice staff lacked experience with practical management of the equipment. So looking at discussions. Initially, we reviewed the NICE guidelines and we drew out these main issues. Firstly, discussion. There were four suggested points in the patient pathway for discussions regarding the decision around NIV. Firstly, soon after diagnosis. Secondly, when monitoring respiratory function. Or thirdly, when it deteriorates. Or lastly, if the patient actually asks for the information. Secondly, we looked at assessment, selection and competencies. NICE suggested three monthly respiratory screening and that team members who provide non-invasive ventilation should have appropriate competences. Thirdly, we looked at withdrawal. NICE recommended that discussions regarding withdrawal were initiated while patients were considering NIV, although detail with the practicalities of withdrawal was limited and seems to be directed to a professional with experience. This was something we had no experience of as a team, and specifically for NIV and MND, 
although withdrawal of treatments is not unusual in the context of specialist palliative care. We are very used to withdrawal of fluids, nutrition, antibiotics, for example. But often the act and then the result of death is then longer than in the withdrawal of NIV. So aims and what did we want to achieve? We wanted to design a hospice training program that would cover the following. To help staff become confident to discuss NIV, both from diagnosis and help patients make decisions, screen and refer the right people at the right time. We wanted to educate all palliative care staff regarding relevant ethics and law. And we wanted to train staff to manage the equipment and interfaces, especially out of hours, when usually the problems seem to arise, and lower the risk of complications, for example, due to pressure from the interfaces. We also wanted to educate regarding the withdrawal of non-invasive ventilation, and we also, importantly, wanted to give an opportunity for staff to reflect on difficult cases and to be able to ask questions. So starting in 2013, in November, we sat down as a multidisciplinary team to reflect on five recent cases of withdrawal of non-invasive ventilation within our hospice. We then attended external training in 2014, four hospice staff, including ward staff, physios, and myself, we each attended a two-day British Thoracic Society NIV course, and we attended the King's MND Centre Study Days, which are run in collaboration with St. Christopher's Hospice. The physiotherapists of our team gained spirometry competencies at Bournemouth Hospital Respiratory Physiology, and my colleague, physiotherapist Ali Lysett, completed competency training in NIV at Southampton Respiratory Centre on an honorary contract. In 2015, we completed further respiratory literature searches on respiratory screening. We also sought advice from our MNDA Regional Care Development Advisor, Louise Rickenbar. Starting in 2015, we developed local staff competencies. A plan for a three and a half hour training session, which was reviewed by Southampton, Southampton Respiratory Centre. This was a mix of presentations and practical sessions, of which included respiratory function in MMD, the practical management of the ventilators, and discussions and decision making. In addition, we presented professional guidance on the law and ethics that support the decisions surrounding both commencing NIV and withdrawal of NIV. We used resources from the BBC Radio 4 programme inside the Ethics Committee, which addressed the uncertainty and the conflicts that arise in a team when staff have differing ethical understanding and values. A Macmillan unit um, pathway was started and we found other hospices nationally were also trying to write very similar pathways to what we ourselves had developed. We'd also designed a respiratory screening tool for use by the hospice physiotherapists. And in collaboration with the Pan Dorset MND group, we developed a respiratory care pathway with local consultation from palliative medicine, neurology, and respiratory consultants. NIV was added to the hospice inpatient nursing care plan in collaboration with our clinical lead. This is the Dorset respiratory care pathway that we wrote collaboratively, which is on the MNDA and Dorset CCG websites. Its local use is intended for primary care and for non-specialists. Discussions and ethical decision-making are actually a key part of this, car, of this um, pathway. This was as part of a wider set of Dorset pathways for MND, including nutrition, communication, and importantly, end-of-life care. While we were doing this, NICE published updated MND guidelines that incorporated management of NIV. 
and the Association of Palliative Medicine published detailed draft guidelines for withdrawal of NIV in MND, which we decided to use and we actually discontinued the development of ours. So the training that we actually delivered between um, September 2015 and February of this year. We delivered five three and a half hour training afternoons. All specialist palliative care trained staff attended, including ward and community nurses, consultants, registrars, medical and therapy staff, Macmillan Day Centre staff, and the discharge coordinator for the hospice. It was also attended by our MNDA Regional Care Development Advisor and some local um, physiotherapists who have an interest in MND. We collected feedback and we asked staff to rate themselves on the following three questions on a scale of one to four, where one was poor, two was adequate, three was good, and four was excellent. 44 staff in total completed the evaluation forms. You can see here the one to four rating along the horizontal axis. Blue is before the training and the green columns are for after the training. For question one, this was regarding the recognition of respiratory failure in MND. 93% rated themselves good or excellent after the training. And actually this is important as recognizing signs and symptoms is a trigger for having NIV discussions. Secondly, when asked to rate their practical confidence, 88% rated themselves good or excellent after the training. In real terms, the staff are more confident in their skills. However, the best results were in the area of legal and ethical frameworks, where 97% of staff rated themselves good or excellent after the training. This has supported both competent and confident NIV withdrawal, both initially within the hospice and more subsequently out in the community. And this has had the added benefit of supporting many of our primary care teams who obviously don't meet this on a regular basis and need that additional support. Therefore, our three key points for today to summarise. Hospice-based MDTs can be confident in NIV discussions and decision making including withdrawal and practical management from diagnosis right through to end of life. NICE guidance actually suggests that a multidisciplinary team can improve care and extend life for people living with MND. Our second point is that staff need training to be confident and competent. Hospice-based palliative care MDTs can develop the skills and confidence to manage NIV through from diagnosis to end of life. And lastly, our third point is specialist palliative care teams based within a hospice are ideally placed to deliver this. Hospice-based teams help the right people select NIV at the right time and for the right length of time, recognizing that they may wish to discontinue this. Extending life is not everyone's priority, and NIV is not right for every person living with MND who fits the criteria. The importance of discussions with advanced, um, appropriate discussions within advanced care planning is very much part of our hospice care. And a palliative approach is very much about nurturing um, within the MND um, our, and our mindset not so much about fitting a criteria and a set of numbers. Specialist palliative care is about the whole person, respecting their individual preferences, attitudes, wishes, values and beliefs. And many of the skills inherent in a hospice team can be used to provide and support this care. I thank you very much for listening. And I'd like to thank the, our local Motor Neuron Disease Association group of Dorset and um, the New Forest 
who have sponsored our attendance here today. Thank you very much. Um, we are running a little late. Thank you very much for that, Jane. We are running a little behind. So do we have any questions at all? Perhaps take one. Or if not, you could find Jane in the break, maybe. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you, Jane.